All right, we resume um, with our next speaker. Abe, are you around? Brilliant, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our very own um, Abraham Toby from the University of Johannesburg. And Abe will tell us today uh, about uh, towards an epistemic compass for the internet. Take it away, Abe. All right, um, thanks, Veli. And I'm just to once again welcome all of you and thanks for the, to the presenters to all those that have um, registered to participate in our workshop. So my talk today will um, be titled towards an epistemic compass for the internet. Um, Abraham Tobias Veli has introduced me from the University of Johannesburg Philosophy Department and the African Center for Epistemology and Philosophy of Science. All right, let me begin. Now, for most of us, we rely on the internet as our primary source of information. So we wake up every day in the morning, we go there for our news, either from a social media platform or some other blog or news agency that is available to us on the internet. Now, there is this ease of access to the internet for us to consume the information available there, but it's also similar kind of ease that we have to put information up on the internet so I can decide to open a blog tomorrow and it will be available to whomever wants to view it. Same thing with any social media platform I have. So we have this internet there available to all of us as a source of information, either as contributors or consumers of um, the wealth of information available on the internet. And this is in most times or in the literature described as having the potential to democratize knowledge in the sense that everyone can come to participate in the spread and um, delivery of knowledge. Now, while um, the internet offers us this kind of access to knowledge and to information, it does not have the same kind of rigorous standards that say an academic journal, for instance, would have. I know there are issues of predatory journals and other sorts of biases that um, rare the review process of journals, but at least there is this standard that exists that aims to ensure some level of credibility with the information that comes out um, via the means of this academic journal. We don't have that with the internet. And this growing problem has led to like a huge deal of misinformation and disinformation. The more popular ones are with the American election and with the coronavirus, stories about the vaccine, where the virus came from, like lots of this misinformation and disinformation exist on the internet. And it's almost primarily because everyone can contribute and there is no guideline as to what can go on the internet, what is acceptable and what isn't. Now, a recognition of this pen, of the pernicious effects of um, the spread of ignorance has led um, social media outlets like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and the rest of them to employ a system of independent facts checking, right? To make sure that the information put up on these platforms at least are factually correct. These um, automated fact checking system are responsible for checking what is true, what isn't, and either flagging them or deleting them from these platforms. Now, this is a step in the right direction, right? Because it's better than no fact checking or no sort of um, measure for what goes on the internet and no warning for when the information we get on the internet is either true or false. But it's still not all encompassing because when we look at this independent facts checking system, there are lots of other considerations that we need to also think it, take into account. There are the monetary benefits for the social media outlets. So it becomes a question of are they willing to risk the monetary gains for um, ensuring credibility, that's not their primary purpose. Their primary purpose is um, the monetary aspect of things. And there are the biases of either the individuals that operate the systems or even the algorithmic bias that um, we've come to know more about within the literature. And there is also the issue of epistemic, um, epistemic bubbles and echo chambers, which in a sense ensures that people are able to remain within a particular information space and we really can't do much about this because if for instance i decide to start a blog to start spreading any sort of story i like 
there is no fact checking service that would be able to um, do anything to this individual blog that I've put forward. So as good or as beneficial as this independent fact checking might be, it really does not um, capture what we need from something like that, especially because of the epistemic downsides that comes with all these extra factors. I'll talk about them more in the course of the presentation. But as it stands, the question remains, what sort of epistemic standards are required for us to attend to these issues? And that's what I intend to at least argue for a starting point um, with um, my presentation today. And I'm arguing that there are at least two factors we need to prioritize, right? The first is the democratic aspect of things. The fact that the internet is open to all, we can all share and consume the knowledge available there. It's an intrinsic feature of the internet, so we can't escape that. That's one aspect of things we need to prioritize. And the second dimension is the epistemic dimension. So beyond mere information on the internet, what are the epistemic dimensions of it? What are the value of this information to knowledge? What are the downsides of this information to knowledge? These are the two um, aspects I think we need to prioritize. So just, um, I'll um, try to argue for this first by talking about the nature of online information, the current compass that exists, the independent fact checking. I'll try to talk about it and talk about the reasons why I think it doesn't work um, sufficiently. Then I'll propose a compass and yeah, I'll conclude from there. All right, let's get going. Um, so for the first aspect of it, the nature of the information we get on the internet, I've talked about how the information we get online is open to all as con consumers and contributors to this um, bank of information. And this idea of democratizing knowledge or information, it's a good thing because it means people get a platform to express their voices, people get a platform to be exposed to information that they would otherwise not have um, had access to. But this good aspect or this positive aspect of the internet is also what brings about the downsides to it. So we think about the example of the academic journal I used initially. The fact that it's closed, the fact that there is this peer review process, the fact that there's this rigorous um, system to get work published on there is what at least ensures that a good deal of the things that come out there are credible information, are useful information, are information that we can consider to be knowledge. This does not exist to the internet as is, and that's um, what, oh, that's where the problematic aspect of the internet and the knowledge or the information available there is. Now, as consumers, right, and I mean, there are positive aspects of being a consumer of the information on the internet, where you could employ some virtues and interact properly with it, but I'm not interested in those parts as yet, because when we're talking about the problem with the internet or with the information available on the internet, we're thinking of how people can take everything they see online seriously. And these are like the gullible people, whatever you see on the, in on the internet, you swallow it up as true knowledge or true information. And there's the other aspect of it, where there are contributors to the um, information bank available on the internet. We all have access to this. And one of the features that the internet affords us is the ability to be anonymous. And from the literature, see that when there is this feature of anonymity, people are not or it's possible for people not to be as motivated in saying the truth as they would have been in a traditional epistemic encounter where you're known to who you're speaking to the feature of anonymity gives people some sort of leeway with the truth, knowing that there are no consequences. Now, these are like the pernicious aspects of being consumers and contributors to the internet, right? And for this talk specifically, I just want to focus on the consumer aspect of using the internet. So there's of course, lots of analysis that could be done on the contributor aspect of things. And I'll leave that for now, but I'll focus on how we are and how we can act as consumers of information we get on the internet. Now, as consumers, the primary thing we get from the internet when we go to it every day or whenever we do is information, right? And there are two, two possible aspects of this information we get on the internet. It could be true, 
So we could get information, for instance, about the president of South Africa on the internet. It could be true information, but it's possible to also get false information on the internet, for instance, about who won um, the American election. It's also possible to get certain information on the internet, right? By certain, yeah, I mean, like information that have like good justification where whomever puts information up there gives good reason for why that is the case. And it makes those information for us more believable when it has this element of certainty. And it's also possible for us to get on certain information on the internet where people just say whatever they want, no evidence, no repercussion, and it's just what it is. And it's in this kind of domain that we get things like fake news on the internet, some conspiracy theories, stories about the shape of the earth. These are all um, aspects of information we could get on the internet. And obviously these are pernicious. These are part of um, the reasons that, for instance, inspires um, social media outlets to employ systems of independent fact checking. But my aim again in this paper is, or in this presentation is to talk about how we as consumers of information on the internet can be, should I say judicious consumers of this information? So I won't focus on these false claims and those kind of things we could get on the internet. Now, as judicious consumers of information on the internet, what we get from the internet, our expectation at least, if we are judicious consumers of information on the internet, is something that we could liken to knowledge. And I'm being deliberate about saying liking it to knowledge and not just outrightly calling it knowledge because again, that would lead to a whole other debate on why is it knowledge, what counts as knowledge. Just as a placeholder, let's use knowledge as um, what we aim for, at least when we go through the internet, because I would guess you would agree that knowledge, for instance, no matter your conception of it, no matter how you think um, knowledge should be understood, is of a higher epistemic um, benefit or value than mere information. So we'd we'll use knowledge as a placeholder. And for the analysis that follows, I would use the JTB account of knowledge. Again, I know there are lots of problems that come to this, but whichever account of knowledge you want to go with, it's still going to hold the same um, kind of normative force in terms of what we should take as um, true information or the kind of information that we take as more valuable when we get it from the internet. Right, so with the current compass we have, right, justification and truth is aimed at through this system of independent facts checking. The system of independent facts checking that has been employed by various social media outlets. Now, I had mentioned initially that there are some problematic aspects to this, and I'm just going to talk about those problems now in more details. There is first the aspect of the monetary benefits. That's the primary reason why these um, social media, media outlets were formed. You think of the Cambridge Analytical scandal, for instance, how those sort of disinformation and misinformation campaign were aimed at basically making money for the parent company that um, employed these services. So there is that monetary benefit. As noble as a fact checking system might want to be, this monetary benefit remains the primary aim of these social media outlets. And that also means that, I mean, as it is, it's not an epistemic um, consideration, right? The monetary benefit is not an epistemic consideration. There is also the aspect of evasion, how these days people who want to evade the independence or the facts checking software and algorithms um, can employ whatever method they want to do it. I heard from a colleague the other day that people now can decide to spell, for instance, vaccine and spell it with an X. The Facebook algorithm won't be able to pick it up. So whatever misinformation they want to spread about the vaccine would still go out there those who see it would know what they are trying to say, but here with this evasive method, we no longer have um, the fact checking system doing what it was intended to do. 
there's also the aspect of bias and we can think of it in terms of the algorithmic bias also in terms of like just people's bias in general i remember with the nigerian election in 2018 facebook um, employed a fact checking system to check the um, stuff posted about the election in nigeria and to flag things as either true or false information for a population of almost 200 million people they had four people doing the fact checking and none of these four people spoke any of the indigenous languages that these informations were written in so there is no way you expect any sort of credible fact checking to happen within that kind of system and a fourth consideration is also this stuff on echo chambers and epistemic bubbles and um, we've had um, chris talk um, a bit about it so i wouldn't go about i wouldn't go into both of them in more details but the pernicious aspect of this is that it could create epistemic environments where people still get to share whatever information they want to share remain within that sort of epistemic framework or within that epistemic space and not have this fact checking systems interfere with that sort of spread of misinformation disinformation or whatever sort of um, activities go on in these epistemic spaces now with these four effects and i mean these are not the only pernicious effects of the fact checking system right but these are just four i've chosen to mention at the very least you would agree with me that if all these considerations are taken into account any belief formed out of um say relying on the facebook algorithm to tell you true versus false information is at the very least an unreasonable belief right even if we've done our due diligence if our primary justification is that the facts checking system showed us that um, this is true information and we ignore the fact that there are these other factors that could affect the epistemic um, validity of this facts checking system any belief we form like that would at the very least be an unreasonable belief so now the compass i'm trying to propose to help us as epistemic agents within the internet takes two considerations into account the democratic aspect of things right which is that everyone contributes to the internet and everyone has access to the information on the internet so we can all be consumers and contributors to the internet and the second aspect is that we need to take epistemic considerations seriously and like i had said initially it doesn't matter the theory of knowledge you would want to go with just the basic idea about knowledge what knowledge is and excuse me the higher value we place or give to knowledge versus mere information or mere belief that's enough to go with that consideration and this leads to a distinction between just mere information and knowledge right what the democratic aspect of the internet offers to us very well is access to information all kind of information what we as epistemic agent for instance who are presented with this information ought to do is find a way to sift it or utilize it in the formation of knowledge and the shortfalls of um, the fact checking system for instance shows us that we can't rely on these institutions to to give us proper knowledge or ensure that the information we get online is something that can amount to knowledge so it somehow keeps it all leaves the responsibility with the individuals with the epistemic agents trying to consume the information on the internet now the democratic aspect of um, things on the internet can be made sense of right with the literature on social epistemology the pr basic premise is that knowledge can be acquired from others and our social situatedness plays a role in our form in our formation of knowledge and in our acquisition and utilization of knowledge now this consideration from social epistemology makes sense of the democratic aspect of the internet but it doesn't take away the problems i've mentioned initially because these problems again are there because the internet is open to all as contributors and consumers of the knowledge available there 
So while social epistemology makes sense of the fact that the information there could be useful in our acquisition of knowledge, it doesn't take away this other aspect of things, right? And that's where the epistemic aspect of things comes into the picture. And with the literature on virtual epistemology, we'll be able to make sense of what's the epistemic responsibility of the individuals who consume knowledge or information on the internet or to do. And the basic premise of um, virtual epistemology is that epistemic and intellectual virtues and vices play a role in our lives as epistemic agents, right? Now, taking this into account, within this um, sort of framework that I am arguing for, justification and truths then would involve, well, I'm just going to argue for two things here. First of all, some sort of credibility judgment, right? When we get information on the internet, there are markers of credibility that we could use, first of all, to verify if those informations are true, like if the sources of those information are true sources of information, are believable sources of information, or are credible sources of information. These are credibility judgments now that has to lie with the individual who consumes the, in the information on the internet. You can't leave this responsibility to the um, social media outlets or other organizations that have other benefits or other reasons to put their information out there. So out there, so as epistemic agents, this is at least one consideration, the credibility judgment of the information we get here. Yeah, this is something we should carry out ourselves. And the second is the epistemic virtue of conscientiousness, which basically requires us to do the epistemic work necessary to verify and to validate the information we get online, rather than be just gullible and accept whatever information we get online. And then when um, Chris was speaking initially about um, epistemic ascent as like some sort of disposition where an epistemic agent asks themselves, what are their sources? If those sources are trustworthy and if um, there are other evidence out there that could lead to them doubting it. This is the kind of attitude that I would think a conscientious um, epistemic agent using the internet ought to embrace, to be able to judge between just mere information or to at least be able to use mere information in the formation of belief and of knowledge. Now, this versus the other considerations of the current epistemic compass would lead us to the point, or lead me at least to the point, where I'll say that if these considerations are taken into account when we consume information on the internet, we at the very least are able to form more reasonable beliefs than if we do not perform these epistemic labels in our consumption of information on the internet. Right, so yep, I think that is it. I'd started off um, with the intention of agreeing that a possible solution to some of our online epistemic worries should prioritize at least two factors, and they are the democratic and epistemic dimension of the internet. Now, I've argued that even if the democratic aspect of the internet is in part responsible for why we have these pernicious epistemic practices going on on the internet. It is an irre irreplaceable part of the internet. It is what makes the internet what it is. So at the very least, we can employ some epistemic virtues that will make us better consumers of information on the internet. Thank you very much. <laughs>